So first, the bad news. So what does the latest SN4 explosion mean for the future of Starship? And then the good news. Wonderful. Just wonderful. Everything. Really everything went flawlessly. History was not only written, but it was written in the best possible way. Then it appears that Starlink will have its first major client. The US Army, of course. Then China has revealed their space station plans for the coming years and they are busy recruiting taikonauts. And while on the topic of China, we haven't yet mentioned their quite new gigantic radio telescope and their SETI plans. Yes, China now has its own SETI program. A lot to talk about as always, so stay tuned. The fourth static fire test of Starship SN4 had been successful. SN4 even got a mask installed on top to simulate the weight of the nose cone and also to increase the precision of the gimbaling control of the Rapture engine, thus increasing the overall stability. But then, tragedy struck again. Another tragic loss in the line of Starship prototypes. First the Mark I, then the SN1, then the SN3 and now the SN4. Thanks Mary, by the way, for these amazing shots. And we are glad that you are fine after this explosion. The cause this time was apparently an unexpected flame from the flame stack, which ignited the propellant in SN4. And now another potential source of mistakes has been added to the list of things to avoid in the future. But should we start to worry that SpaceX's approach might be a bit too hasty? Is SpaceX working too fast, pushing things too hard, and thus making too many mistakes? Well, this is a difficult question to answer. We have to remind ourselves how fundamentally new the Starship concept is. And an old steel spaceship of this magnitude has never been constructed before. So of course, failures are part of the process. Steel construction has the major advantage that it's super cheap, so Starship prototypes can be pumped out at a rapid speed. But it's certainly harder to do than with carbon fiber composites. However, the latter would be much more expensive. So every time a bit more is learned and a bit of progress is made. SpaceX doesn't normally repeat a mistake twice. It is a learning process and sooner or later SpaceX will have done every possible mistake, thus it will get harder and harder to make new mistakes at all. And the next starships are already waiting in line. SN5 will soon be ready, SN6 will be stacked soon and even production on SN7 has already been started. So we think there is no need to worry. But of course, taking it a bit slower and trying to avoid unnecessary mistakes is also not a bad idea. We think that these setbacks are not as bad as they look. So we'd say now on to SN5. But the explosion unfortunately overshadowed a really important development regarding the flights at Boca Chica. SpaceX took a major regulatory hurdle, namely the approval from the FAA for SpaceX to conduct suborbital test flights. This is a super important regulatory milestone, because as we remember up until now, SpaceX still only had the regulatory approval of the FAA from last year's Starhopper test, which only allows for hopping tests up to an altitude of 150 meters. But this approval was now extended by the FAA in a quite surprising move, we have to say. To also include, quote, suborbital reusable launch vehicle missions. The extended permit is now valid for two years, until May 2022, and will allow SpaceX not only to carry out 150 meter hopping tests, but also higher hopping tests, as well as the 20 kilometer skydiving maneuver. So basically everything below orbital. For orbital flight, a new permit will of course be necessary. However, this makes us optimistic that FAA will indeed give out a permit as soon as Starship is ready for the first orbital test flights, which will happen at some point in the coming year or years, depending on how fast the progress at Boca Chica will now unfold. The sooner the better, of course. And now to the Demo 2 mission. Wow, just wow. History has been written, ladies and gentlemen. 
But not only has history been written, but it has been written in the most perfect way possible. The Demo 2 mission was a full success. Everything went flawlessly. The launch, flawless. The landing of the Falcon 9 booster on the drone ship Otsizli, flawless. The docking of Crew Dragon with our two heroes Bob Banken and Doc Hurley to the ISS, flawless. We can't believe it ourselves how absolutely perfectly this all went down, but we are so happy. You cannot imagine how happy we are. Actually, you probably can because you are most likely equally as happy as we are. It was so important that this launch would go well and now it did. Therefore cementing SpaceX's role as the absolute leader in human spaceflight. Ciao Boeing, ciao Blue Origin, ciao everyone else. The time of SpaceX has come to finally rise and shine. And it did so with fanfare. It did so in the best possible way imaginable. But beware friends, because we should not celebrate too much. We should not get complacent now that the US regains its ability to launch into space. Because there is still so much to do. And as we detailed in our last Friday's video, we should have had a moon base since decades now. And should have landed humans on Mars in the 90s. So yeah, compared to what should have been, this is still not a cause for a giant celebration. Let's do the giant celebration when Starship has landed the first humans on the moon. When we start to build our first moon base. And when Starship has landed the first humans on Mars. These will be the causes for giant celebrations. Don't get us wrong, we are super happy about SpaceX and Elon himself returning America's capability to launch astronauts into space. But this is just the beginning and we should never forget that. This is just the beginning to regain what actually should have been, to correct the mistakes of the past, to bring humanity back on track so to speak, to finally establish our moon and mars bases. So let's celebrate, but just enough, not to get too complacent. And many people always say, yeah, but moon and mars spaces are not economical. There is no financial incentive to go there. And to that we say, not yet. You can regard it as an upfront investment. The return will come with delay. When Columbus sailed westward in 1492, it was a huge upfront investment with not much immediate return. The return came with quite many decades of delay until a new economy was established in this new world. It will be the same here. And an important, nay actually a crucial piece of the puzzle in order to make it happen will of course be Starlink. Now we know that SpaceX currently makes its revenue from the launch contracts. And more and more money from NASA is flowing towards SpaceX which is an excellent development of course. With Crew Dragon, with the launch of the Gateway by Falcon Heavy in 2023, with the resupply of the Gateway with Dragon XL with the Moon Starship. All these are excellent developments and will be great sources of future revenue. But the biggest source of revenue will of course be Starlink. Starlink will be gigantic. We cannot emphasize enough how extremely huge the revenue from Starlink will be by the mid of the 2020s. And already now, the first big customer has signed a deal with SpaceX to use its broadband network. And you guessed it of course who this customer is. The US Army, of course. Yes, the US Army has signed a deal with SpaceX on the 20th of May to use the Starlink broadband service for three years. Formally called a cooperative research and development agreement, this contract will allow the US Army to gain a competitive advantage due to the low latency offered by the Starlink broadband network. Of course, new ground terminals and receiver antennas will have to be used, which the army is already in the process of investigating. This is an excellent development for SpaceX. We predict that the next big customer for Starlink will be Wall Street. High frequency trading with lower latency will give those algo bots a huge competitive advantage. Therefore, Wall Street will invest billions into Starlink. Mark our words. Isn't it wonderful but also ironic at the same time that basically the military and the greed of Wall Street are funding our future in space. 
And we also think that the Space Force will sooner or later sign a deal with SpaceX to buy quite a few starships as military troop transporters or for other Space Force variations of starship. Why? Because China of course. China has now unveiled their timeline for their space station and it is quite an aggressive timeline. They plan on launching the first module of the future space station already next year on a Long March 5B rocket with the station to be fully assembled by 2023. It will consist of three modules with a total weight of around 66 metric tons. Now while the station will be quite a lot smaller than the ISS, still China will have its very own space station. And that is just the beginning as we know. Because their ultimate end goal is the moon. They are not even secretive about it. So the space station is the very first step in order to gain some experience working and living in space. They already tested their capsule that can host 7 passengers, which will be the same capsule used for their moon missions. So yes, China is advancing and they plan to recruit 80 new Taikonauts to that end from their army. And then we shouldn't also forget their upcoming Mars probe, which is set to launch in July 2020 and which will touch down on the Red Planet in early 2021, complete with a lander and a rover. And then the Chang'e 5 lunar sample return mission, which is planned for sometime later this year. And as if that wasn't enough, now they also want to search for aliens. Yes, they have their own very large radio telescope. The FAST telescope, which stands for 500 meter array spherical telescope and is the largest radio telescope in the world. And now they are launching their own SETI program to search for signs of intelligent alien civilizations with the help of radio waves. This is a really cool development and SETI is a very important program. However, it's extremely unlikely that the Chinese will find anything. Not because of the lack of intelligent civilizations. On the contrary, we actually think that the likelihood of the existence of a few technological civilizations in our galaxy is quite high. We will make a special video on that topic by the way. So the real reason why it's unlikely that the telescope will find anything is that it has to look to the right star at the right time. And the star system must have a super high power alien radio beacon directed exactly towards us, employing radio waves. The odds for that to happen, even if there were thousands of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, are super low. And radio waves? Why not smoke signs? Probably radio waves would be as primitive to the alien civilizations as smoke signs to us. But for sure, this is an interesting development. And the more people are searching for intelligent alien civilizations, the better. Because you know, we might get lucky after all. Who knows? So what do you say to the FAA's surprising move to give SpaceX regulatory approval for suborbital flights? Wow! What's I'm going really on? surprised. Yeah. And do you agree with us that we should celebrate the successful Demo 2 mission, but we shouldn't celebrate too much in order not to get too complacent? And if you're wondering why we still don't have a moon base and why NASA's Apollo moon base failed, you can check out our last Friday's video right here. So thanks as always for watching the JS Space Report and then I would say on to the future.